Hello and welcome to Marinations. My name is Sharon Skolnick Bagnoli and I'm here with Mark Wyman right here at his office, offices, uh, enterprise called Regent Press in Berkeley. And um, he has uh, produced, published quite a few books. I don't know if you can see them, but there's a pile of books here and that's just some of what you've done. And one of the books is the Oracle. Oh yes, and yeah. That that too, was the gathering of the Oracle newspaper from the '60s. Yes, yes, yes. That Alan Would you like Cohen to see that? I got that here. Um, it's impressive. Yeah, it's okay. a very big book. I mean, if you're going to do a book, okay. why, why fool around? So read it. Up, read it. Up. It's a very big book. <laughs> if um, I know that you've produced this also in. Um, in the form of a, oh, a CD, a CD. We did, we did a CD and a so DVD. does I'm, the CD I'm, have every page that's in here? It's got every, everything there, and and uh, 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 plus a movie, plus a soundtrack. Uh, uh, this was a very interesting project um, as, yeah. as, as a printing publisher. The the, the 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 article. I think one of your questions was going to be what 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 am I proudest of as a publisher? Right. And I, I, I don't mean to jump ahead, but since no, that's okay. but since you're holding it in your hand, I think this was a this was a very significant project. Uh, we did it about 20 years ago, predates computers. Well, it doesn't predate computers, but predates the modern computer oh my God. revolution. Yeah. And we we sort of did with that what they did with printing when printing was first invented. We reprinted. This is like a, you know, a, was an attempt and a successful attempt to preserve a moment of history. It was an old newspaper from the Haight-Ashbury. And had, had we somehow not managed, I mean, probably could have been scanned today, but we have, we have, we have to take it for the period. Mm -hmm. We sort of, it was a bit of a time machine. We recaptured it, we redid it, uh, we preserved it as printing is supposed to do. I mean, we used printing in its traditional sense to create history. Because I, I've always taken great pride in not just being a, being a publisher, I always say region press printers and publishers because what is what is publishing based on? It's based on printing. I mean, in, it in has the early been. days, it has been. It's yes. all changed now. We are at such a crux in the history of publishing; it's unnerving. But that's okay. One learns how to reinvent oneself. But but uh, we'll, we'll we'll come to that in a bit. But what you hear, I think, is a magnificent example of the printer's art. It's like it's like it's like uh, you know every every you're supposed to have a magnum opus, and this was region presses. Oh, sense, just to do it, just to to, ca to capture what was a newspaper. And, and, and Alan Cohen's, you know, magnum opus. We, yes. we, we must, we must indeed give him, give him the original uh, credit for carrying not just creating it, but for carrying it around for twenty years so it wouldn't fade into oblivion. Yes. And then somehow hooking up with me on some cosmic level to actually bring <laughs> this thing out again. And then you know the fact that I was able to do this in the print form, and then, <coughs> excuse me make a CD out of it. I mean, this thing has indeed been digitized. You know, we've moved it into the future. Mm -hmm. So a printer, I was able to capture and preserve a bit of history, which I've always Fantastic. seen as both the, as, as the job of the publisher and the job of the printer, I mean, when, when they were connected. Well, yeah. I knew Alan, you knew Alan. He's passed away, mm -hmm. but his uh, legacy is forever, of course. So my understanding is that he had a dream oh, where yes, he yes. saw uh, a newspaper that had a rainbow of color in the printing. This was back when you didn't see that anywhere. And he woke up from that dream and thought he needed to make it real. And this was actually, when it was really done, first done, it was split fountain that they, they squished the ink from the tubes and, oh, uh, yes. and rolled the presses. And I, I suppose it changed uh, a bit as, it, as the presses rolled, the colors would probably change to some extent. Well, when you consider that it was all done with an exacto knife, that's kind of what I get a kick out of. Mm -hmm. I uh, I use an exacto knife as a <laughs> as a graphic designer. I did, and of course, I'm now a reborn graphic designer. This digital, mostly digital, but uh, I know when I taught graphics at San Francisco State, and I, I thought I was joking, you know, but I brought in the I brought in the exacto knife and I brought in the triangle and the and the T square, and I said, this is what we used to use, and here's press type. And this uh -huh, is a nice, uh -huh. you know, but the way they listened, the expressions on their faces when they listened to me was like, dinosaurs, you know? Well, I remember a guy coming into my shop and I was indeed using press type and, 
you know, typesetting that came in strips, and he was disappointed. He was looking for the type. He was looking for the tons of type that you used to find in a print shop. Oh, yes. And he was terribly disappointed that I wasn't doing individual letters backwards. Mm -hmm. And I, I said, there are shops that will do that, but I, I, I didn't have any. Mm -hmm. Well, we did that at, at KQED back in the 70s. When I, oh, I was sure. No, that graphics until, until the computers came yeah. in. There you and go. I wanted to ask you, did you, did you fall in love with uh, typography? Letter Fa forms? I, absolutely, once I, really, yeah. once I really got into it. I mean, the whole visual thing of, of, of the book and the page and the layout and the typeface and the design. Yeah, I'm just going to hold the, up things that you don't have to comment on oh, them no, if you no, don't want to. But this, this is Ralph Metzner's series. And you do these covers, right? I, I, Mostly? My thing is I design the covers, yeah. I design the insides, I do everything. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I don't actually print myself, but I do everything to uh, encourage the printing. Oh, I have to meet the authors too. I mean, I have to get the people to uh, you know, be willing, willing to publish with me. And no, I, enjoy, I enjoy publishing on that. It's not a. Many, many, oh, this many is the book I wanted letters. Alan to hold oh, the presses in fact, on. In fact, in fact, this is significant because today is indeed 9-11. We are doing this on 9-11. And another one of our publications, um, uh, An Eye for an Eye Makes the Whole World Blind, Poets in 9-11, another region press publication that I'm terribly proud of. This is something, again, we did with dear Alan Cohen, you know, the mm -hmm. departed hippie poet. And this was a book of poetry about 911 that came out exactly a year later. Exactly. A Can year you pick later out a one. short one and just read I, a few you know, phrases? I, I, I can't Would you rather not do it? I'd, I'd rather not read a specific okay. one, but I'd rather comment on the entire okay. idea of it. And this was when war was still a complicated thing. This was actually still when some of the poets were a little bit angry. They didn't. They didn't feel that we actually deserved to have the World Trade Center, uh, you know, uh, knocked down and might have felt, indeed, we were perhaps sucker punched. And it was a complicated book. It was examining, and this is all faded. I mean, this is all now history. I mean, this is even, even the wars that had started are now winding down. But it was a complicated poetic response to a series of complicated feelings. It wasn't necessarily Poets Against the War, a yeah. book which came out shortly afterwards and somewhat stole its thunder, uh -huh. but poets reflecting on the war and reflecting perhaps indeed on the desire for retribution. I mean, you know, one, one, one had unseemly emotions that received poetic expression in this. It was a Penn Award winner. You know, it had hundreds of people contributing to it. Mm -hmm. And Alan, in a similar way to, an, to the oracle, managed to harness the energy of a community, you know, to express themselves. And I was delighted to, as a printer and publisher, help him put it together in, in, in a relatively short Well, he was time. delighted and, to and, work and, with uh, you. I mean, I know that. He, you know, I talked to him, and he was very happy about we your know, connection. We did, we, did good, we, did, we did good work together. Um, yeah, I wrote a poem that I got to him after this was already oh, going to press. Oh, I, I said, hold the press, you know, and he... he he said he couldn't do that, and I was disappointed. But it would have been good in here. It we could have looked it up. But no, that's very no, significant. Okay. That still yeah. sells. I mean, we, 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 for poetry, it did well. It's great. You know, poetry is a difficult thing to um, difficult thing to sell. Yeah. So, do you ever work with graphic designers other than yourself? Um, occasionally. I mean, I. Mm -hmm. in, in, in fact, I mean, I do enjoy the graphic design. That's. Ha that's half of the business to me. That's half of the reason why I'm in it. Mm -hmm. um, I will occasionally work with people on covers because um, those are tricky and, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, sometimes I can't quite get what people are looking for. And if I get very busy, I'll farm out work and work, mm -hmm. work with people. Um, uh, you, you, you know, Reg Regent Press is, it, it may be the offices in, in the Regent Press building, but there's actually... <laughs> I'm not sure who else is here. <laughs> <laughs> this is I actually worked with you on a book, and we didn't uh, do it. I did the cover. But we don't. It's not in this pile, right? Oh, no, so no, we no, can't just was, I, easily I just, pull it up and say, "Here well, it is." Well, that, that was a very interesting book. I, that, 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 from, uh, well, that was from Hollywood. From Hollywood to Vienna. Hollywood to Vienna. A trip and a half. There you go. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, the person on the cover. Uh, is actually a, a montage of a person um, who is a surfer, and the, the head of the surfer is my cousin, ah. my, my cousin Daniel, on the body of a, uh, of a surfer from various sources that I put together. But it actually works. It doesn't look like it's That's a disembodied. Cover. It looks like fun. It has a, 
Thank it you. It has a hippie quality. It has a sort of yellow submarine quality to it. Right. It's exactly. Thanks. Capturing the period that the book is trying to represent, a mm -hmm. coming-of-age novel. Well, you know, the invisible hand of the market weighs heavily on publishing. Heavily. I mean, talk about that. The, talk about I've how been, I was attempting a segue. Yes, you did <laughs> I'm, it. I'm, go, I'm you going for it. Yeah. I mean, it's it's an interesting observation that 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 ninety percent of the books, perhaps more, that are published, do not make money. I mean, in a major publishing house, you know, of all the stuff mm. that they're trying, of all the stuff that they're getting out there, they you know they bear they don't make money or they barely make money. I mean, you know. But some books make an enormous amount of money. So, I mean, that's what major houses are kind of geared, to geared towards. Uh, uh, publishing years ago, before my time, used to be a gentlemanly business. I mean, they knew what would sell. They knew a way to work it. You know, they knew they'd have to invest a lot in it. Mm -hmm. But they knew, you know, if you had the right author, you had the right subject, you could. And if you sold 5,000 copies, 10,000 copies, great. Everybody made a buck and you could move on to the next thing. But that's changed, was yes. changing so dramatically. I had one mentor, Sebastian Orfoli from Andor Publishing, brilliant guy. He once said to me, don't mock the bestsellers. I read them and mock them. And he says, let me see you get one. You know, figure out what they're doing. So yeah. um, let's see where else are we. Okay. We're How do you edit the books that you publish? Do Gee, you content that's, the uh, that's, that's, well, that's when, when people, that's, that's very interesting. By the time a book comes to me, and in the nature of one of the ways I work, mm -hmm. the books are often ready to go. I, I, I don't, I mean, I always vet what I publish, and I read it to make sure it tracks. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if it works, it's fine. If people, if people want editing when they work with me, um, you know, I, I, you know, I'll turn them on to a number of editors if, 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 if that's the level. Mm -hmm. Often, often, you know, the books ha have been extensively edited okay. by the time, and the people are just ready to go. They're perfectly happy with what's there. Um, you have to watch out for editors because if you give a book to an editor, edit editor, they'll edit it for you. But it's one of the stages of the process, mm -hmm. so that's they might some. over edit it or. Well, they'll edit it. I mean, make they, it go not, sideways. They'll or make it go sideways. Yeah. They'll, they'll often make it. It's very dangerous to. T I mean, you need, you need. Depending on the, your certainty, mm -hmm. your your certainty. If, if you can find a Maxwell Perkins, then you're oh, very lucky. Oh, aren't we all editing. looking for Maxwell I know, Perkins? I know, but I don't. I'm not. I'm not sure they make them anymore. If or you if stand up and write on the top of the refrigerator exactly, and throw your pages you in a box, do you think Maxwell Someone's Perkins will come appear? Someone's going to along with a short, stubby pencil. <laughs> Someone's going to run along, grab them up, have yeah. them type and worked on them. Oh, them's was the days. Yeah. Well, he really was somebody who kind of revered his writers, too. And, you know, we, we all, uh, writer or not, we all want to be revered on some level. Well, you need that. I guess ultimately, I mean, ultimately, a, a writer really would need an editor. A, a writing is ultimately a symbiotic process. I mean, you have to write for someone. And I guess a real writer isn't writing for the greater public, they're writing for, for their editor. editor. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had a friend uh, years ago named Kevin, uh, who has a houseboat in the city. And he, um, he was a writer, and he had on his wall, it said, um, write in red heat, edit in cold blood. Ha, ha, ha. You know, kind of... But, but that's not, I mean, yes, absolutely, but sometimes you have to start out cold and heat yourself up while, while you're writing. That's how we began to speak before. Mm -hmm. You know, people, who, people who are, you day. know, often people are motivated to write something in the, in it, when they're seized with emotion. But if you're really going to do a 900-page novel, or you're, you know, it's, it's a tedious, it, and, and if you're really going to make a living at it, I mean, writing is a very tedious, you know, very tedious, demanding process, even if you're not going to make a living at it. It's a tedious, mm -hmm. demanding process yeah. because I would suggest that most writers don't make a living at it, but I mean, they still have to work very, very hard, you know, very, very mm -hmm. hard at it. It's curious. I mean, my own publishing company and the way I work publishing, uh, do publishing, occupies an interesting niche in the whole process. I mean, I work on several levels with publishing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I do indeed have my own list at Regent Press where I, you know, I package books and I bring the books out and, and you know, I, I put time and money into them mm -hmm. with varying degrees of success. Some of them make a little bit of money, some of them lose a little bit of money, some <coughs> of them just kind of tread water. And I gotta say, over the years, I've investigated various ways to do it. 
I occupy in the old days, I mean, the idea of publishing as a capitalist enterprise where, you know, you invest money in the book and you bring it out there and you make a product and you sell it and you make a profit. You know, on one level, that's actually kind of crass. I mean, that's a relatively recent invention in publishing. Mm -hmm. In the old days, of, in the old days, I mean, let's go back to Alexander Pope and the Rape of the Lock. I mean, let's go back to probably Gibbons, you know, the, you know, the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. What would happen, they would have a subscription. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. people would announce a book, an author would work at it. I mean, you mm -hmm. know, especially a serious academic work. People would subscribe to it before it was ah, published. And that's and where the they, money came that's from. That's where the money came from. Like you think, a printer didn't do a book saying, well, I think I'll put every penny that I have and mortgage my house into this and see if anybody buys it. They'd be out of their minds to do it. They'd go out of business before they knew what to right. do. They, they're, 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 somebody was, somebody was going to pay them to do all the work, mm -hmm. and people would subscribe to it. I mean, authors were well known, and they had a certain notoriety. I mean, this was a very this we're talking. You no, know, and we're we're talking before the masses got involved in it. We're talking, you know, the mm -hmm. aristocratic days of early publishing, and that's how you would do it. The capital would be raised that way. You know, the book would be published and sold. Well, you can move that into the current times of uh, something called Kickstarter or something that's, well, that's online, sure, to raise and maybe the, ask for your book to be subscribed to. A very good way to do it. It's, it's another idea. It. And then, absolutely, absolutely. What, what do you think about the digitization of publishing, and are you going that way? Oh my gosh, the book is dead. Long live the book. <laughs> it's absolutely fascinating. I was reading, uh, it was either Paul Krugman or Tom Friedman. They both write for the New York Times, and I'm always confused which is which. But one of them observed, we always have to be constantly recreating ourselves. I was sitting with a friend the other day, and he was looking at his Kindle, and he was delighted with it. He said, this is great. I can change the typeface, and I can you know, enlarge the type as I want to. And I screamed. I said, wait a second, I'm a typesetter. I don't want you to change the size of the typeface. I don't want you, <laughs> I don't want you to change the type font. I worked very hard to think about that. Mm -hmm. And I watch, I watch, I often feel in what I do, like a scribe at the time of Gutenberg, yeah. you know, somebody who had a very good business, you know, right, you know, and all of a sudden, over, and all of a sudden they, they pull the rug out from under you, mm -hmm. and you constantly have to reinvent yourself. Yeah. And then InDesign gives us, you know, the book. And uh, you make the decisions of what type yeah, you're using. Yeah, this is know. sort of the fun. It's just like you have to. I mean, there's so many mm -hmm. minute decisions that you have to make. You know, from the initial conception, what typeface to use, to all the elegant things like you know the you know the title page the introduction, the, mm -hmm. the running heads, you know, what goes. It's subtle, mm -hmm. but if you don't do it quite right, it doesn't quite work. Yeah. And if you do it right, it kind of works beautifully, and people notice it, but don't really notice it. Exactly. So, I mean, it kind of Beautiful. goes Beautiful. That's very like nice. The end, the drop I love caps, that the chapter face. headings. Yeah. Subtle. That, to me, is the art of, art, art of book layout. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how to, have, how to have each page. I mean, you know, Communication has always been the page. The book has always been the history of the page. That's why these new digital devices, you know, kind of when they do away with the page, it kind of breaks my heart. But yeah. the larger ones are bringing the page back. It's such a natural human form of communication. Well, there is a dual book that yeah. you know you could ha you could actually have the book on one side, the page, and then you could put the that's, illustration in color on oh, the other side. I kind but that's of not like that. No, that's interesting. But I don't. Let's see if that catches on. It didn't. The, I didn't. It didn't. Somehow catch on, the, but I the like tablet it. itself seems to work. Yeah. I mean, that seems to. Yeah. But the tablet, you know, an iPad will preserve the page. I mean, even if it's only one at a time. Mm -hmm. And you know, so I work with this, and I can change the type, and I can move things around. And I mean, this is what we do instead of typesetting. Right. You know, you highlight it, and you can, mm -hmm. and you adjust it, and and. Uh, so this is what books like before, you know, before they're printed. Now how, what kind of choices do uh, do the writers have to get to this point? I mean, well, how, how much do you consult with the writer? Or how much do well you? Now that's the thing with the writer. I mean, you know, on one hand they say, well, do it yourself, but a writer isn't a graphic designer. A writer is obsessed with the words. I mean, there may be, I mean, they may, mm -hmm. they're not a graphic layout person. I'm obsessed with the Unless words. they're both, which Unless I happen both, to be. But it's a but different, you know, well, there you it's go. A different, but, it, but it's yeah. many, many writers. The last Most, thing yeah. they want to do is to, lay, is to typeset the book. This is not what they're into. Mm -hmm. even, ev even if they decide that they're going to publish it themselves or do some combination, they're not typesetters. They're not graphic designers. Or if they do it, it just looks clunky. I mean, it's mm -hmm. just, it, it just doesn't, doesn't quite come together. Mm -hmm. It's doable. 
It's doable, but I mean, they, you know, they're lucky if they work with a graphic designer. They yeah, in general, it's it's good that the the um the different tasks are separated. It but seems, I'm yeah, you know, yeah, I'm wondering yeah. for when the writer when the writer puts his or her book in your hands, oh, then I, what do you show them? Uh, at what point when you have a prototype or the whole book? Oh, sure, interesting, interesting question. I mean, I, I assume they get some sense of what I'm about, that I can make it look good. Mm -hmm. Then I show them some of what I've done to say, this is what I've done. Do you think it's cool? And they usually do. Mm -hmm. And then I say, well, of all of these things, what do you like the best? Or, or I say, bring me a book that you like so I can work oh, my design a, yeah. around your book. Mm -hmm. and, or I talk to them, I look at the book, and I get an intuition. And I say, why don't you see what I come up with? And if you like it, it's fine. And if not, we'll come up with something else. I see. <coughs> and they'll tell me. And sometimes it works great the first time. Sometimes it'll take a half dozen times before I'll get it just right. Other times, you know, it'll just be comp. But eventually it's got to be done. Right. So I work very closely. One of the, one of the advantages, if you decide to, um, uh, you, you, you know, uh, bring the book out, is to work you know, you have control over it. I mean, you, it, it, it's not taken mm -hmm. out of your hands. Uh, the author, when they work with me, when I work as a publishing consultant to them, uh, you know, if, if they want to publish through one of my publishing companies, um, they'll have the last say in design, and they'll have as much input as they want or not, as the case may be. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to please them. You know, I want it to look good. And, mm -hmm. and you know, people have different senses of design. Mm -hmm. So I give them whether or not they want it total control, and I'll take back the control if they don't want it. And make this is actually a book that I'm putting. This is a book that I'm actually putting a lot of time, energy, and money into. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, this is a major project, and this is this is this is this is one of my investments. And this is a book by a celebrity. Guess who I bumped into? What's here is is a proof. When a book goes to the printer. And it's ready to be. It's ready to be printed and ready to go. They get, and this one's in color, so I was worried about it. Mm -hmm. I got back a printer's proof. I mean, this is what you see is what you get. And of course, when I say to my author, you know, I've asked you to proofread it every time up till now, and you haven't because you've been too lazy, and because you're sick of it. Now that it costs ten times to make the changes, now of course you'll proofread it. So it's what they did, and they found all sorts of subtle uh -huh, things of course. to do. They always I, do. It's just, I mean, it's the very, very last minute, and, yeah. and you know, so I'm going through working on it. And this is actually a very clever book. This is by a, 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 a famous an ad guy, a guy named Bob Pritikin, for whom I'm doing two books. Local writer, Bon Vivant, um, lives in a mansion in San Francisco with a swimming pool in his living room. Used to own a boutique hotel and was an ad guy. He's like one of the original madmen. I mean, if, if, you know, he was an advertising guy, and it works. You can make a lot of money in advertising. I wished I'd uh, met him earlier in my career when I could really make some money with him. But this is a book about the famous people who crossed his path. Liberace, mm -hmm. um, uh, Mickey Rooney, John F. Kennedy Jr., Carol Channing, Eddie Fisher. Mm. I, I mean, these names will mean something to... I, mean, I love the title. You choose a certain font that sort very of... Very clever, very this clever is design. Eddie and, fisher -ness. In the interest of full disclosure, I didn't actually do the design of this book, but oh. I'm doing the publishing and I'm doing the... I'm doing Someone the else designed yes, it that he... I took it over and I picked I it up. And it's very clever, very clever structure, a, 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 a letter Robin that Williams. sort of relates to the character, Robin yeah. Williams. Then a little bit about who the character is, a mini bio of why they're so significant, if you don't know why they're so significant. Then Bob's encounter with them, because at his boutique hotel, mm -hmm. um, uh, where Robin Williams came to stay, and, and he talks about trying to do a kitty show. Uh, Bob was a magician, and then Robin Williams was staying at the hotel in the audience. And, and he, uh, 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 Bob said, why don't you come up and try to entertain the kids? So Robin Williams got up and, you know, he had the, he had the kids in stitches. And I've been flying Barbara Streisand. So I'm doing the corrections now. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. working on the last stage and then I'll send them in. It's nerve-wracking to do a book. I hate when the book is all done, there's a thousand copies. And, you know, my author calls me up and says, look at page 92. It's a typo, it's yes. A typo. Yeah. I say, you signed off on it. I told you to proof it. You didn't, you know, I don't. I know that moment is terrible. It's just, it's kind of, there's so many details. It's like any piece of art. Mm-hmm. You just have to put so much time and energy into it. Excuse it me. is a piece of art, and I think that it's reassuring yeah. for people to, uh, to understand that even in, as things get digitized, there's still a, a, an art process that oh, goes into making a book. Oh, enormous amount of detail. Book. 
Yeah, I mean, almost the thing with yeah. art, art is like an alchemical condensation, where all this time goes into something that's briefly, just briefly appreciated, but so intensely appreciated. I mean, you know, hundreds, thousands of hours go into a book, and it takes you five hours to read. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, dozens of hours, hundreds of hours go into a painting, and you look at it for Paintings, two minutes, even minutes, less. I, I like writing in some ways better because it captures the person's mind for, for longer. longer they look at if, a painting, it's like, you, oh. If you can get them to read the book. Yeah. I mean, otherwise, they, at least they can see the painting when they're walking quickly by. That's true. I mean, the... the um, so, no, I've done, I've done, since I've been in business, I've done a couple hundred books, and of all, of all, on all levels of all sorts. I mean, I, I like doing history. I mm -hmm. think one of your questions was how I've contributed to the, you know, the Bay Area. Yeah. And I must say, the big yeah. article, I, th I was very proud of that, because that's history. Mm -hmm. I mean, that captures the moment of the Haight-Ashbury. As Alan Cohen used to do, it's the Rosetta Stone of the lost civilization of the hippies. I mean, it's a historical artifact, because mm -hmm. ultimately... History is the printed word. I mean, you know, memory would not exist without printing. And that's what I've done. And towards mm -hmm. that end, I mean, that's a, a piece of history. Um, another one of a major book that just came out this year, big book, I mean, my mm, God, they don't thick. make them like that anymore. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is The Sky's the Limit, People v. Newton, The Real Trial of the 20th Century. This was another book in which I ma you know, made a major investment of my own time and energy. You know, it's, 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 it's one of the mm -hmm. publishing projects. Huge. And 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 it's about the Huey Newton trial and the Black mm. Panthers that happened in 1967, and how it indeed changed American history and how the trial, uh, had Newton been found guilty, there could have been a race war in America, the likes of which we only imagined. But because he didn't, because he was allowed, America is a wonderful country. Because even though Newton was accused of killing a cop, he was able to turn 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 the tide turn the camera and put America on trial for 400 years of racism. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it wasn't, it, you know, it wasn't, it's a very complicated, very complicated story. Very interesting. So that was history. And you talk about, I mean, so I consider this a major contribution right. to the interpretation of the Bay Area. Thank you for watching Marinations today. Uh, you've been watching and listening to Mark Wyman, who is publisher and printer at Regent Press. And uh, he can be found at Regent Press at MindSpring.com. And I've been with you. My name's Sharon Skolnick Bagnoli. And the show is called Marinations. It's a nutritious stew of nature, culture, and ideas. I hope to talk to you again. Thank you. Mm -hmm.